Welcome to Dune Club Session 6. For this session, you should have read pages 327 through 370, which begins Book 2, Muad'Dib, and ends on the sentence, and only I will remain. Now for the recap. Previously in Dune, the Harkonnens have successfully launched their attack against the Atreides with the help of the Emperor. Outliving his usefulness, Dr. Yui is murdered, but not before he sets his last plot into motion that helps to save the lives of Paul and Jessica. In the Duke's final moment, he activates his poison gas tooth, just missing the Baron, but taking the twisted Mentat, Piter, and the captain of his guard down with him. Paul and Jessica escape their captors and are rescued by Duncan Idaho, who takes them to a secure location to hide out. The traumatic events of the night, coupled with his recent intake of spice melange, have triggered an explosion in Paul's awareness, who is reeling to cope with his newfound prescience. The sleeper is now woke. In session six, Thufur Hawat and what is left of his men are trapped with some Fremen southeast of the city of Arakeen and are eventually taken by Sardaukar. Meanwhile, Paul and Jessica are taken into a hidden Imperial Ecological Testing Station by Idaho and Kynes. The young Duke is successfully negotiating an alliance with the Fremen when his meeting with Liette is cut short by Sardaukar. Paul catches a glimpse of Duncan Idaho's death before hurrying into a secret passage leading to a thopter that he and his mother used to escape capture by flying directly into an approaching storm. So let's start with Thufir Howitt. He is currently hiding out, House Atreides is down, and he can't stop going over the events of the night with his Mintat brain. He just keeps going over all of this information. And when everything happened, when everything went down, he was in a garrison village, and he is staggered by the size of the attack on House Atreides and is cursing himself for underestimating the obscene amount of money that the Baron was willing to spend. <laughs> the Baron hired like over 2,000 ships and more than 50,000 soldiers. And Thufir estimates that this attack cost around half a trillion solaris. That's a lot, like that's a lot. What's the solari ratio to a dollar? I'm not sure what the solari ratio is to a dollar, but uh, half a trillion of anything is a fucking lot. <laughs> So now we see that the Baron, in addition to all the other losses that he took that we talked about in session five, he's also taken a major financial hit in funding this coup. Thufir is also thinking about the traitor, that it was Jessica. He's still wrongly blaming her as being the traitor and he vows to kill her if he ever finds her and he's thinking about this when the Fremen guy who's hiding out with them and his men interrupts his thoughts with news that Gurney Halleck is safe with the smugglers. And after this exchange between these two men, communication quickly breaks down. Like, they're discussing what to do next. Howitt has a bunch of wounded men. He keeps asking this Fremen guy, oh, you know, can you take care of my wounded? And how it does not understand that when this Fremen guy answers him and keeps asking him to make a water decision about his wounded, what the Fremen means is he feels that these wounded men are essentially dead men. And he asks Thufir if any of them are willing to hurry it up and die so that they can stop being a burden on their tribe so that they can have their water reclaimed from their dead bodies so that the others can continue, you know, for the survival of the tribe, because that's how the Fremen would do it. If you're a wounded Fremen and you're just a burden, like you just let yourself get killed and then get your water reclaimed because there's just no point otherwise. Yeah, they're super hardcore like that. Another interesting thing about this chapter is that we finally get to see the Fremen in action through Thufir. And how it is shocked to discover how insane the Fremen warriors are. I mean, the Fremen have captured an artillery weapon from the Sardaukar easily. He's like, what, you guys captured one of them? He's like, yeah, we took it, but it's not really that great for us because it's not built for the desert. Uh, he also is like, what? 
when the Fremen learn that they're fighting Sardaukar and they're like, oh my god, these are the Sardaukar? Like, they're so excited to be facing these guys in combat. And like, anyone else in the Imperium would be like shitting their pants if they heard they were Sardaukar. But Fremen are like, oh, really? They're actually pretty good fighters. The Fremen have also captured three Sardaukar alive, which is unheard of. And seeing how badass the Fremen are, how it decides to join with them and bonds his water to them. And one of the ways that he signifies this is by giving them one of his newly dead, one of the wounded died, and he gives them the body to be rendered down for its water. And this is the standard Fremen procedure. Like your flesh is your own, but your water belongs to the tribe. And they like go and they take your body and they put it in a thing and it smushes all the water out of you and then your tribe can drink it. Again, it's it's really like water conditions are really fucked up on Arrakis. Let's just keep that in mind, everybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> before you judge, before you go around judging. Now before they themselves are finally ambushed by the Sardaukar, Howitt also witnesses some Fremen savagery with the use of this really cool messenger bat. Like this guy has this messenger bat and like gives him a little, little bit of spit and then flies him off. And then whatever message he receives like causes some huge explosion, which was super awesome. He also sees a band of Fremen in the distance pretending like, oh, we want to get captured. And so these Sardaukar come up to them. And then all these other Fremen pop up out of the sand out of nowhere, easily killing this troop of Sardaukar and taking their Thopter with surgical precision. And then using that same Thopter to kamikaze into a huge troop carrier that's on its way. And like the Fremen guy who's with Hawat is like, well, that's a totally reasonable exchange. One of our men for 300 of their dead, like that totally works for us. And the Fremen are gonna go down and any of those bodies that like fall on the ground from this, like they're gonna go reclaim that water. So it's totally like, yes. And Hawat's like, these people are so insane that they're willing to like kill themselves in kamikaze. Like that's not something that people are really doing within the Imperium. Damn, a lot of action in this chapter. <laughs> Fremen don't play. Uh, and at the end of this chapter, they are overtaken by Sardaukar, and Thufir is hit by a stunner. So we don't know what happens to him. Now let's cut back to Paul and Jessica. They have finally emerged from their ordeal the previous night. They were in their still tent. They get out of it. It was a whole to do just to even get out of the tent. And Paul and Jessica have slept through the deadly heat of the day because it's so hot in Arrakis, like you don't want to be awake during the day. And they emerge from the still tent just as night is falling. And Paul is now way more together than he was the night before. And he takes the first sip of his own body's reclaimed water from his still suit and reflects on this as the moment of his, of his new life. Like now he's truly living an Arakeen existence. Now, while Paul is intent upon allying himself with the Fremen, Jessica wonders at how quickly she has become a satellite pulled into the orbit by the gravity of her son's newfound power. So now they're out of the still tent and they see in the distance these huge pillars of fire with these purple lines of laser guns because the Harkonnens are in all of these thopters and they're essentially cutting up the desert. I mean, they're just blasting it in an effort to eradicate them because they know that Paul and Jessica escaped and they're just doing anything they can to try to kill them. So now let's cut to the header of the last chapter of session six. And this header explains Muad'Dib's powers a little bit further. It states, Muad'Dib could indeed see the future, but you must understand the limits of this power. Think of sight. You have eyes, yet you cannot see without light. If you're on the floor of a valley, you cannot see beyond your valley. Just so, Muad'Dib could not always choose to look across the mysterious terrain. He tells us that a single obscure decision of prophecy, perhaps the choice of one word over another, could change the entire aspect of future. He tells us the vision of time is broad, but when you pass through it, it becomes a narrow door. And always he fought the temptation to choose a clear, safe course, warning that path ends ever down into stagnation. So now Paul is in one of these moments where even though he's prescient and can see all these future timelines, 
the now that's around him is very unsure. And so him and his mom, they're out of the tent. They're looking at the fireworks. And then Duncan Idaho and Dr. Kynes descend on them in another thopter. It scares them for a second. But then they're like, okay, it's Duncan. And they take them into one of the hidden imperial ecological stations that the Duke was wondering about earlier. And Kynes is wondering to himself why he's risking his life helping these people. Like, he's still undecided. He's kind of helping, but he's like, maybe I could give them to the Fremen. I don't know what I'm going to do here. So he takes Paul and Jessica into his office, and he wants to hear them out. You know, he kind of, he wants them to make him an ally in a way. I mean, because if he really didn't want to ally himself with them, he wouldn't be doing any of this in the first place. But you got to be suspicious of these things. So first things first, in their exchange, Kynes, otherwise known as Liette, is just calling him Paul Atreides. And Paul is like, he's avoiding my title, you know? And he commands Kynes to start addressing him uh, with respect as sire or my lord, you know? Because he's like, look, I'm the duke now. And Kynes even thinks to himself, like, the only reason that there still is a duke is because of this kid, you know? Like, because of him. And that's, like, no small feat on his part. Now, Paul goes on to outline his plan, and he states that I am an embarrassment to the emperor and to all who would divide Arrakis as their spoil. And as I live, I shall continue to be such an embarrassment that I will stick in their throats and choke them to death. <laughs> the young duke essentially plans to blackmail the emperor to take the throne for himself using the threat of creating total warfare between the great houses and the Imperium. In exchange for Fremen's support, Paul promises Kynes to make Arrakis a paradise when he takes the throne. And at first, this proposition offends Kynes, and he states that his loyalty is not for sale. He was like, I'm not cheap like that. And this triggers an apology from Paul which, like, is the perfect thing to do to him because Kynes is like, Harkonnen would never apologize. Like, this guy really is the real deal because he's apologizing. And so Paul then restates his offer, and he pledges to him total loyalty to the Fremen and to Arrakis for their loyalty in return, saying that he would even give his life for Arrakis, which really touches Kynes. And Jessica the whole time is looking on. You know, she's watching this entire interaction. And she is amazed at how quickly Paul is able to get Kynes on his side. Like that Atreides sincerity, winning people over, is just really coming into play here. And she's just like, how do these guys do this? Like, how do they turn people into their friends this quickly? Now, before Kynes can accept this offer, the Sardaukar attack. Uh, they kill Duncan Idaho, and essentially, like, this seals the deal. Like, now they're done talking, and Kynes is like, well, fuck it, I guess I'm going to help Paul. And so he's like, all right, you guys need to escape behind this filing cabinet into this secret passageway. It's going to take you to an ornithopter, and you're going, there's a storm coming, and your only chance is to head towards that storm and ride it out. And so that's what they do. They go. They find the thopter, they get in there, they're flying away. Immediately, there's all these other fucking thopters coming after them. And they have to dive into this oncoming storm, which they must ride out or die. Which is a fitting analogy. I mean, like, they're in the fucking shit right now. Ride out or die? Ride or, or die. Or ride or die? Yeah, they're literally ride or die right now. Like, literally. Like, it's like, it's really... It's intense. So now, get your questions ready for our live Q&A, which takes place on Sundays at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Twitch and Facebook. For session seven, you need to read pages 371 through 447. And that ends with the sentence, even the Hawks could appreciate these facts. Also, become a member of Team 19 on Patreon and receive access to exclusive videos, like the one I did where I talk about Paul's awakening with the help of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. That one's pretty intense. 16 minutes of stuff. Pay what you want. I don't care.